This is the fourth and last part of lecture four in quantitative big imaging. And uh, we have until now talked about how to segment imaging images. And uh, we also saw that sometimes the performance wasn't that good. And uh, now we come to the topic of morphological image processing. And um, here we have a special kind of filters that compare pixels in the neighborhood around the pixel itself. And with that, we can actually improve the segmentation results quite a lot. These operations are called morphological operations. And um, you can see that the title here is a link. And that's actually a link to the morphological operations library of uh, scikit image. So the assumption behind using these filters is that voxels in real images, they are very strongly co uh, correlated to each other. So if you have an object, it's very likely that um, the neighbor pixel also belong to that uh, object. On the other hand, if you have an isolated pixel, that one is not really realistic that that should be part of the object. So that would be noise in that case or artifacts. And um, let's take a look at a noisy image. We have seen this cross before. It's a little bit wider now, but if we apply a threshold to this very noisy image, you can see that there is a lot of misclassifications and uh, we are not really happy about it. So we want to do something. Uh, a neighborhood is a collection of pixels that surrounds a central pixel or the pixel of interest. And uh, there are very many ways to um, define it. First of all, you can have large neighborhoods that perform over large areas of volumes, but these are quite computationally intensive. There can also be an effect that you smooth out features or remove features. And um, usually you have, can also use smaller neighborhoods which work over smaller areas and volume. And they are of course also computationally cheaper. Um, the problem with smaller one is uh, that you may have problem to uh, fill out large or uh, holes caused by noise. And um, so how do we need it? So one, one reason we need a neighborhood is actually for filtering. And that was the lecture previous week where we looked at different linear filters that looked in the neighborhood or weighted the neighborhood to perform the filtering operation. We can also need a neighborhood for morphological operations, which is what we're going to look into soon. Can use it for component labeling. Uh, that is something that comes a little bit later in this lecture series. Uh, it's about putting labels on isolated objects. We can also use it for computing distance maps, which are maps that measure the distance from the previous object, uh, the closest object pixel. And uh, we can also use it for image correlation based tracking methods. And um, often we, uh, for, for the morphological operations, we call it a structuring element. And um, in scikit image, they have switched this SLM to um, using footprint instead, but the manual will inform you about this. Depends on which version you're using. And um, looking at some typical neighborhoods we have in 2D, we have in general just two that are used for symmetric case. So we have the four connected, which is more or less a cross, and we have the eight connected, which is actually filling out all the pixels around the central pixel. And uh, of course you can be very creative and also with sizes you can change. So we have the disc. Uh, for example, if you have five by five, the disc would look like this. If you have seven, seven, then it looks maybe a little bit rounder. 11, 11, yeah, then it's also again getting more wide, uh, more round, but it's still not really round. Then we have crosses, lines in horizontal and vertical direction. We have something called a star, uh, octagon, 
So you can be very creative, and in particular when you make the neighborhood larger, the creativity can increase, and also you get more precision. For example, if you want to have a disk, you need a really large neighborhood before it's really approximate the disk well. In 3D, we can have a further different um, neighborhoods. So for example, we have the three-dimensional cross, or we have 26 connected, and in between there is yet another one, which actually just takes out the corners, and um, that would be the 18 connected neighborhood. And uh, these can then be used also for three dimensions, and um, that works also pretty well. The fundamental operations for morphological operations is erosion and dilations. And in principle, it says if for erosion, it says that if any of the pixels in the neighborhood is zero or false, then the central pixel will be set to zero. And that has the effect uh, of peeling off a shell or a layer of the object. The dilation is the opposite. So if the neighborhood touches an object, then the central pixel will be in included in, um, in the dilated image. So that has the opposite effect so to the erosion, meaning we add a layer onto the object. So it's like dunking a strawberry and chocolate or something or paint. Um, and um, here we can see what it looks like. So I have imported morphology package from Scikit image. I load a test image, which I just marked up some positions. That would be the central one here. And I have a structure element, which is the four connected neighborhood. And I apply dilation on the image with structure element and erosion with on the image with the same structure element. And when you look at the erosion, there is actually not very much left because this structure element is already uh, very sensitive. There are a few places where the whole structure element actually fits in. And uh, with dilation, you can see that this scattered object turns into a single larger blob. Looking a little bit more in detail, we can see what's going on. So for the dilation, if you have the structure element on this position, that would be we have a cross over around here, and that actually touches the object, and then we paint in this uh, pixel. And so it goes on all over. And uh, in particular, interesting is this gap between the two groups here. And if you have the cross structure element in here, you can see that we actually paint it in. So all the green ones, they are added information caused by the dilation. And then we get this blobby thing. The erosion, then we go on the opposite side that we had. The original is the green. And um, the yellow ones are the remaining ones. And you can see that if you, I would put the cross around here, even though the central pixel is on uh, the, pic uh, the pixel, central pixel is active, then it actually misses out two of these and then it's actually dropped out. And only in this place we can draw in the full cross and also on this pixel we can draw in the full cross. And uh, then we lose a lot of information in that sense. So it's actually breaking up structures and making them smaller. Now, it's not always convenient to really reduce the size or increase the size of the object. So by combining the erosion and dilation, we can actually get something that is much better. And um, if you first erode the image and then apply a dilation on the same, using the same structure element, then it's called an opening. So you're opening up structures that were maybe slightly connected. And um, the opposite operation is then closing. So first you dilate and then you erode. 
And looking at the closing, first um, here we get a larger object. So what's happening is that we actually fill out the hole. We also fill out the bridge, but otherwise the structure very much looks like uh, what the original did, not as blobby as before. When we had uh, this one, it was it's much fatter than um, when you use the clo uh, closing. Opening, as you remember, there was only very little information left. And now with adding the dilation step afterwards, you see you get a little bit larger structures, but uh, we have broken up all these tiny details still, and also smaller islands, they were also not present. So looking at um, the details here, you can the first part of the closing is the blue, the way we do the dilation. And um, then after erosion from the dilated image, you actually see the green parts here, which are added on to the resulting image. So you have a bit fatter throat around these transitions in the closed result. But um, in general, you closed, for example, the hole here and the hole here. And mostly such holes, there are misclassifications. You would actually expect to have something more compact. The opening is essentially the same. So first we do the erosion and then we come down to the yellow ones. And then after the dilation, you see the green ones, which outline the um, final structures. And mostly you will need to do both an opening and a closing in an, some order. Depends a little bit on the condition of the image. The reason is that the closing closes the gaps in um, misclassification, uh, false negatives and the opening closes the false positives. So um, you have to use both mostly in to get a good segmentation result finally. Then there is a problem also when we do segmentation on images, or actually on discrete images, you have a lot of gray levels and um, usually you can't really fully resolve the contour of the object and here we come to something called the partial volume effect and that is when one pixel in real life would actually be part in the void and part in the object then it's hard to distinguish which one is it and um, depending on how complicated your structure is you can have a lot of these ambiguous points caused by the partial volume effect and um, we can see how it what happens. So for example, if you have a very small object of a disk, in this case, you can see that the volume fraction in this image is 32%. And uh, if you have larger object, the volume fraction actually increases stepwise. And uh, when you come up to a very large object, the volume fraction is 44% compared to the 32%. So there is a great difference depending on how well you can resolve your objects. And that is something to be aware of if you want to do some kind of um, volumetric measurements in your quantification. That the smaller the object, the less certain you are. And usually you tend to do some degree of underestimate when you use it. And uh, in these lines, we can also look at uh, when a sphere is really a sphere. And here I did an experiment where I increased the radius of a sphere and compared the volume of it to what it actually should be if you computed an analytical sphere. And um, you can see that somewhere around radius 10, so that's already quite a large object, then still you have a volume error around 1%. And you have to go out quite far before you really have a good quantification of the, of the volume of this object. So you, you have to be aware about these errors. And another thing is when you're rescaling 
then you also can get these uh, partial volume effects. And uh, if we start out with a very large disk here and start some doing some resizing, then you can see that there are, for example, these gray parts here. They're already a little bit uncertain. And then you actually introduce another gray level or else you can do some error in your quantification. So it's not always easy to determine these volumes and um, you are really sensitive to the scaling. And uh, this closes um, lecture four. And uh, we have in this lecture actually divided into four parts. Uh, seen that uh, how the image formation process is related to the segmentation problem because it's depending on how you create your images it can be easier or harder to detect different features in your images and in the beginning we start using the histogram to decide where to put a threshold to segment the image and um, how good we segment can be tested using different methods. We had uh, the um, confusion matrix. Uh, we ha also have um, different uh, the ROC curve that shows the performance at different um, thresholding levels. And then we saw, of course, that we do a lot of uh, misclassifications. And for here, the morphological image processing can help but you have also to be aware that you actually introduce maybe some features that weren't there before or connect objects that aren't there before. And that also relates then to the partial volume effect that you sometimes are not really sure if things are touching or not. And uh, that makes it even harder to make really reliable segmentations. And yeah, that was the end.